As the tide was turning against the Confederate Army, the Union General William Tecumseh Sherman began his infamous raid through the South. The path of this army was from 40 to 60 miles broad, and they swept this path clean, burning houses, destroying crops, and driving off cattle. As the Unionists came to Savannah, that city was evacuated, and the enemy had now reached the gateway of Lower South Carolina. And when the soldiers got to the South Carolina border, it was open knowledge to them that they were going to really fix South Carolina, because we were the first ones to secede from the Union. Instead of marching directly to Charleston, they turned toward Columbia by way of Orangeburg. And he either had three or four contingents of Sherman's men see coming up through South Carolina, through different areas. All of the state's men were away fighting. There was no one left in South Carolina but women and children and helpless old men. They burned courthouses all along the way. They burned every house that they could find. Sarah Elizabeth Culler, the matriarch of the Culler Plantation, began preparing for the inevitable arrival of the Union Army. Toward the end of the war, Sherman's men came. She heard that he was coming, so she took her jewelry and she buried it in a teapot. Somewhere in the corner of what now? Was it a corner of the garden? I think so. Uh, okay. She buried it. She buried her silver and her china. And she asked an old trusted slave to please take the cattle and the mules and the horses, you know, all the livestock, down to the river, to the Edisto River, which he did. And uh, Edwin and his little sister Agnes buried their toys and planted a plum tree over it. <laughs> you know, I guess so they'd remember where it was or so they wouldn't suspect, see, that something had been buried there. By the way, her daughter, Aunt Julia, uh, was living in uh, St. Matthews. And she came over because she was afraid of Judge uh, Sherman's men. So she came over to be with her mother. So anyway, they were sitting on the porch just waiting for them to come. But a great cloud of dust rose in the distance, and they knew they were coming. Sure enough, the other men came. One man leaning forward in his saddle was leading the procession. There seemed no end to his followers. The leader halted at the front gate and shouted, Are there any firearms in the house? And Sarah Elizabeth bravely replied, yes, I have an old musket hanging on the wall inside. <laughs> the Yankee dismounted from his horse and stalked inside, grabbed the musket from his resting place and marched out of the house. And stuck it in the roots of the live oak tree there and broke the top off so it couldn't be used. And so anyway, I just say many years later, I could see that old rusty musket. In the, in the roots of that tree. Every time I went there, you know, to the house, I would see that old musket. Well, it's not there now. It finally just disintegrated, you know. Oh, the soldiers, well, they did what they did everywhere in South Carolina, really. First thing they did was to pour a barrel of syrup on the living room floor. In the meantime, the livestock came from the Edisto River. So we don't know whether the slave let them go or whether they just got away. A slave girl who had seen grandmother hide her jewelry then directed the soldiers to that spot. Sherman's soldiers just took everything. They even ran, the, ran and took the chickens out of the yard. You know, ran the chickens down and, and took those. And they piled the wagon high with the meat that Sarah Elizabeth had, you know, kept. And they took all of that and Aunt Julia's white horse. I, I feel so sorry for her because, you know, her husband had just been killed. In those days, horses were really important to people. And so the soldier got on the horse, and the horse was just rearing and pitching, and Jews said, please don't, please don't take my horse. It's my husband's gift to me, and he's, you know, he's been killed. So he said, oh, I'll just take him down the road a little piece and let him go. And, but the horse continued rearing, and Aunt Jews said, oh, maybe he'll get off of him. <laughs> you know? But uh, he didn't, and uh, he rode the horse down the road, and they never saw him again. The soldiers, they must have spent the night there because they were dancing around there after dark at the gin house across the road where all the cotton was stored, and they set all the cotton on fire. It was four years of cotton that, that my great-grandmother had saved up because she couldn't sell it because um, the port of Charleston was closed. They burned it all, and they were dancing around there like Indians you know, in, in the firelight at night, you know. 
I know it's a terrifying sight. My great-grandmother told the captain that uh, she just had, had nothing there but her little children, that all of her sons were in the war, and maybe told, her, told him that one of them had already been killed. I don't know about that. And so after they left, uh, she found some ham stored in a secret place. And she felt sure that the captain had done that for her, and she appreciated that. After pouring the barrel of syrup on the living room floor, I don't think I'd have been very appreciative. But anyway, I guess she was glad she had some food for, for all those slaves that she had, you know, who had already been freed, by the way, at the time. But they were still there, and she was responsible for them. There is evidence of a fire at the house, but it was put out quickly. Whether this was set by Sherman's men is unknown, but the house was saved. But Aunt Julia, you know, who came over, her house in St. Matthews was burned. See, so they, so they burned most of the houses. They said that you could tell along the road where Sherman's men had gone, because all the houses were gone. Orangeburg Courthouse was burned, and that's the reason we have so few records of the Revolutionary War and, and all, anything before that, because the courthouse was burned and there was nothing you know, remaining. Sherman's men also went to the house built by Adam Hallman. Adam had died shortly after the war began and left his wife Annalia the home where she continued to live with her children. Her daughter, Margaret Ann, was a young woman of 20 as the war was coming to a close. In the distance, Annalia saw the rising dust from the approaching army. She also saw smoke from other plantation houses the Yankees had burned. The story is that they came to Mr. Zimmerman's plantation, which is just above here, and Mr. Zimmerman had taken his family to Columbia for safekeeping. Nobody was there but the slaves. They, uh, it's said that they stole everything that they could carry off and then torched the whole place, whole plantation, burned the homes. And they went next up to the Whetstones, which was above there, and Ms. Whetstone had recently lost a son in the service in Virginia, and she was deathly ill at the time and they prevailed upon the Union soldiers not to burn the home, and they didn't. Then they found out about this home, and they doubled back and came down here, and my great-grandmother was in the kitchen at the time, and uh, she watched the soldiers come in and dismount in the backyard. And when they, <laughs> they dismounted, it said that she pull, pulled her apron over her head and ran down the back steps hollering, smallpox, smallpox. And of course, that was a dreaded thing at that time, and they all got on the horses and left. Thanks to her bravery and ingenuity, the house was saved. Soon after the Union troops left the Orangeburg area, their large army arrived in Columbia. The mayor of the city surrendered her to Sherman and hoped he would protect the city. He stopped across the river from Columbia, and the mayor came out and said, please, please, you know, save this, the city. And uh, Sherman says, your city will be just as safe in my hands as it would be in yours. And you see, that's a <laughs> iffy thing. He didn't, he didn't say he wasn't going to burn Columbia. <laughs> Two days later, the sun rose to reveal the city of Columbia utterly destroyed. Columbia, our beautiful capital city, lay in ashes and smoking timbers. Sims history of South Carolina. They did burn Columbia. And I think what is interesting about that is everybody was so sure that Charleston was going to be burned that they loaded uh, the people who had money in Charleston and, you know, whatever, uh, valuables, they put them on railroad cards and sent them to Columbia oh for safety. But anyway, Columbia burned almost completely. And then they went on burning on uh, the upstate and everything. When they got to the North Carolina border, he made a statement to his soldiers. He said, remember, boys, says this is North Carolina now, and North Carolina is the last to secede from the Union. <laughs> See, which meant you better act better now, so. The war ended with the surrender of the Confederate Army on April 9, 1865.